Now, the Ghana Police Service has interdicted three of its officers who have appeared before Parliament's ad hoc committee investigating the alleged plot to remove the IGP, George Akufo Dampere. Now, according to the police, this will pave way for internal disciplinary action into their conduct. Let's take a look at the police statement. It's now on your screens there. It reads, the police service has interdicted Commissioner of Police COP Mr. George Alex Mensa and Superintendent Mr. Emmanuel Eric Jebi, as well as Superintendent Mr. George Asari, in connection with the audio tape which has become a subject matter of investigation by Parliament. The interdiction is to make way for disciplinary proceedings into their conduct in line with the police service regulations. And that's signed by Grace Anzakofi, the Assistant Commissioner of Police, Director of Public Affairs. Well, lawyer for COP Alex Mensah, Kweko Wusa Jiman, described the move by the IGP as wrong. He's concerned about the development and how it will affect his clients in the ongoing probe by the ad hoc committee. They have been said with the interdiction letter. This was done um, yesterday. Well, it comes as a surprise to us because, um, as you know, Parliament is investigating this matter to establish the facts. And um, some police officers have already appeared before Parliament. Others are also giving indications of their willingness to give evidence um, before Parliament. So um, this is quite uh, a surprise to us. Um, but as leaders, as it may, we have received the letter. We are also working on it to see our next course of action. Oh, he is he's fine. We have had conference with him early this morning, and then um, we are in, the, in a few hours from now. I'm sure by close of day, you also know what we make of this letter. What this is seeking to do is to gag other officers who have tried to come to the committee to give evidence and which we think is, a, is an unhealthy development. You know, when you appear before a committee of parliament, I mean, whatever answer you give to questions which are posed to you according to the constitution cannot be used against you. It's only when you commit to perjury. Uh -huh. So if this is a cause of action in which the police now wants, it has a likely result. Let's stay big longer on this because this is big. We're joined on the line now by the security analyst, Dr. Ishmael Norman, for more. Many thanks for joining us here on Joe News today. Now, this is happening at a time where the ad hoc committee probing the leak tape is even yet to publish their results or even report. How would you think this move by the police service will affect the two people before the committee right now? Um, thank you for the opportunity. I think it's the, the move by the police uh, to interdict this uh, three gentlemen is totally premature because it looks like they're trying to, uh, in addition to what the Manson's lawyer, Alex Manson's lawyer said uh, just a moment ago, um, they're trying to guard any other officer that may have information to contribute to the ongoing investigation. And, and the IGP is pre-positioning the police as if it's over and above the parliament, which is also very, very sad development strategically. The optics looks very bad. I think that they are also gagging any other police officer that has an issue against the establishment. This is why I said it was wrong for the investigative parliamentary committee to do anything in camera because we are going to not we are not going to have the benefit of hearing what it is that they, they told the parliamentary um, investigative committee uh, in, in in camera which may help other police officers to come out to second it or to refute it so this whole move is just terrible only in Ghana. 
Now, that's interesting. You make mention of that because we know Superintendent Asari requested an in-camera hearing. But then we also know that the chairman of the committee revealed that a new tape has surfaced, which they are going to listen to and come up with further instructions as to what to do moving forward. Now, this move also brings a question about the IGP and how he's running the service. Now, what are your thoughts? How does this make the service look like? Right now, the, the, the service doesn't look good at all. The IGP doesn't look good at all. Uh, initially, I spoke for the IGP that, as a manager, he has the right to be arbitrarily in his decision. So long as you observe due process, equal protection, and equal opportunity, these elements were missing in his decision making. So if I were him, I would listen to what the people have to say and then try to implement corrective measures to improve the service delivery. The in-camera conversation that will take place in this, look, what was more important than the Watergate investigation? Not a portion of it was heard in camera from May 17 to November 15. Everything was in the public view. So I don't support this in-camera hearing at all. Then you better not have started it in the beginning because now it's going to lend room to conspiracy theory. And because of what has just happened, the IGP and the police service is going to be subjected to low esteem evaluation by the public, the Ghanaian public and the world. Mm, interesting. Now let's look at the officers in question here that have been interdicted. How would this affect their career moving forward? You know, when you are interdicted, first of all, your salary, I think you don't receive the full salary. So you receive about maybe two thirds of the salary. And uh, when you are interdicted, you basically, you are not part of the police force until you are reinstated, even though you are not technically sacked from the force. So if they are not part of the, of the police force, then why do you do an in-camera investigation about the activities that have led to the interdiction? I think that this is just terrible. You also lose certain opportunities like an uh, emolument that you already earned. This is somebody uh, like Alex Mensah is about to go on retirement. Why do you do that? You know, I, if I were Alex Mensah, I will now be boldly speaking to the media about everything and I will reject any in-camera conversation, I will let the public, the Ghanaian public know why the IGP is trying to find a way to intimidate him and his and the other men that are being invest, uh, that are helping the parliamentary investigative committee to basically look into the Ghana police services operation under this IGP. Is he going to interdict the four other police officers that have sued him in a court, uh, in a court of law? Because in the court of law, whatever it is that he doesn't want the public to know about will come out. Mm. Thank you so much. Dr. Ishmael Norman is security analyst. Thank you for joining us here on JN Today. Now, the police service is still in focus. This time, they are actively engaging primary school pupils in Accra to educate them about policing. The primary objectives are to demystify the concept of policing and instill a sense of security consciousness within them regarding their immediate environment. This initiative is part of strategies to add meaning to the mantra, police is your friend. It is being led by the IGP, Dr. George Akufa Damper, and my colleague Samuel Mbura is at that event. He joins us live with more. Samuel, what has the IGP been telling children at school? So, Sami, we're finding it difficult hearing you. We'll would come back to you later to get more on this. Let's move on to other stories now. The Ghana Highways Authority is conducting an assessment of work expected to be done on the abandoned Tamamoto Way toll boots. At least one person has been killed, leaving several others injured, sustained from crashes recorded at the abandoned toll boots. Well, Joy News 
in the last couple of weeks has been reporting on the deadly nature of the boots which have become a major sport for accidents on the stretch lately. In an interview with my colleague Carlos Caloni, Director of Road Safety and Environment at the Ghana Highways Authority, Joseph Amezeka, said demolition of the boots will begin tomorrow to make way for their rehabilitation. Unfortunately, we don't have that soundbite. We'll bring that to you later on. Well, the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Authority, DVLA, is facing out all old driver's licensing card issued before September 2017 from the system. The DVLA says these old cards will be replaced with smart driver's license cards. Now, this was contained in a statement issued by DVLA on September 6, 2023. The exercise, according to the DVLA, takes effect from now till the 31st of March, 2024, after which all old cards driving license will be rendered invalid by the authority. Director in charge of driving training, testing and licensing at the DVLA, Mr. Kafui Semevo, tells us more about this initiative. He spoke to my colleague Mamiesi Thompson on Newsdex. Now, from the 16th of this month, all the old ones would have expired. So the invitation is for those who have the old license to submit them for renewal and replacement so that they will also get the smart card license. Ordinarily, if we were using the same license across the country, in the sixth year, you still have submitted it for replacement. And those that were issued, they are in their sixth year. So they would have still submitted it for replacement. So it's not a bad thing, it's a legal requirement. The ITES has always been part of the renewal process. Now, the replacement actually involves renewal and replacement. So in the sixth year, your license is still expired. So as part, as part of the renewal process, that is why you have to do the eye test. Every person who has a license and has to renew it is required to do the eye test. We accredited eye test centers across the country to carry out eye tests for the services that are provided by the DVLA. And we have published the list of this uh, facilities. We've also gone ahead to uh, give signages that identify them and also provide means of verifying those centers. So the eye test is done by the specialists in those centers and the results get to us electronically and we can continue to provide it. Well, let's take you back to our earlier story. The Ghana Highways Authority is conducting an assessment of work expected to be done on the abandoned Tema Waterway toll boots. And we know that at least one person has been killed, leaving several other passengers injured. My colleague Carlos Coloni is currently there. He joins us live with more. I have with me the uh, director in charge of uh, road safety and environment here. Uh, in the person of Joseph Amejake. He's going to be telling us uh, the specific reason why they are here this morning and, and what motorists should look forward to. Uh, you are live on Joy News. So uh, we see you here this morning. Uh, two days ago, you gave us an assurance that you would be here. Yeah. Now you are here. What is the purpose? Yeah, please, uh, we are here principally to uh, carry out a final assessment of the needed works to be done to address the safety problems at the two booth session of the uh, motorway. Uh, so, like uh, you will see, uh, we recorded some accidents here, which resulted in a loss of lives. And as an authority, it behoves on us to take necessary measures to address those safety concerns. So, we are here, we did some preliminary assessment of the works that are needed to address the problem. Today, we are here to uh, carry out a final assessment to, for work to commence tomorrow. So, principally, that's why we are here today. So, uh, as you can see, uh, we want now to limit. We want now to limit traffic, vehicular traffic, to the original motorway section of the, at the two booth section. So we are going to block the extension that we have carried out. We're blocking it with uh, concrete uh, bar uh, barriers. And then all obstacles on, in the way of the original motorway section, that's the concrete pavement section, we are going to clear them off. So that when you are coming from the current end of the motorway, you don't need to 
uh, divert your course. You just come straight using the concrete pavement station, and then you can get uh, you can you can go straight to Tama. And we are also going to install solar powered street lights to enhance visibility at night at this session, so that at least uh, it will enhance safety here. And also make sure that we put in the needed, needed sign, uh, uh, traffic signs, to inform and direct and warn uh, road users. So we think that uh, when these measures are carried out, we should be able to improve safety considerably at this session of the motorway. All right, so for the purposes of clarity uh, of what you're saying, now in your short, you can see that there are vehicles coming all the way from Accra. Uh, they are using uh, the extreme end of the uh, motorway, which uh, before you were using to collect toll. But you are saying that uh, now, with the work that you are going to carry out, you are going to block all those areas and make way on the motorway itself. Which means that when you are coming from Accra, you don't need to detour to the other end. You just have to use the motorway all the way. So which of the, uh, the tow boat are you actually uh, going to um, you know, clear? So we have identified three tow boats which are going to be demolished. So we are demolishing this one, this, this other one, and the other one. So three in all, which are in the way of the original motorway session. All of them are going to be cleared off. And then, thereafter, you can see that uh, the way will become clear for road users. So we are not going to take a diversion through the other sessions, but you just come straight on the concrete uh, pavement session. And by that, uh, we think that we can eliminate uh, as much as possible the safety hazards here. Okay, so tell us also uh, whether you're going to repeat the same thing at the Tama end of the motorway. We want to understand. Yeah. So the identified works will be carried out at the both ends of the motorway, at the tem uh, at Tama end and then Accra to both sessions. So all the two sessions will be tackled concurrently. All right, so beyond this work that you're doing, what other measures are you going to put in place to ensure that motorists are safe because lighting is bad, uh, no uh, road signs and speed uh, control systems here. We want to know beyond clearing of these tow boats, what specific uh, actions are you going to take to ensure that road users remain safe on the Accra Tama motorway? Thank you very much. Like we all know, motorway was built about 60 years ago and it has been seven since then. And as we can all see, there are manifestations of distresses like potholes, cracks on the pavement. And so then in, in the short term, all these uh, potholes and cracks will be sealed. And then subsequently, uh, measures will be taken to increase capacity. That means widening the, uh, the, the lanes, to increase the number of lanes from two, two lane to a carriageway to three lane to a carriageway with interchanges to enhance interconnectivity. Now let's take you now to the Ashanti region where several shops have been removed and artisans evacuated to make way for the Swami interchange project in Kumasi. Affected artisans and traders, however, want the government to keep to its promise in fast-tracking project execution. Nabwachi Yadam has more in the following report. After several months of setbacks, traders supplying all road networks leading to the Swami runabout have been evacuated. The exercise is to pave way for the construction of the long-awaited Swami Interchange project. Some affected artisans say their compliance with the eviction directive must be reciprocated by the government's fulfillment of completing the project on schedule. <laughs> I can't see any interchange here. Did the government evict us because we threw water on a say chain Sabonsu? Well, if we do not see the commencement of the project anytime soon, we will come back to make sales. They have not done anything. Everything they say is a lie. We are giving them up to a month. We must see them working. We will bring back our things to begin our regular job. It 
interchange in our war, you know, Kayam Maya, a e yard of papa and war ye. Namida and say, Wenu, a e yard I could die, I, I do. The interchange would help us, but I don't trust them. They can't complete it by the scheduled time. They will abandon it for the next government, just like what they did at Sofolai. It's only a strategy to let us vote for them again. Interchange, you know? Patrol some some by my idea, yes, sir, mother. Monya Mayana, and you probably bray, mutu, my comedian go for pa. I will bray, my quarter crossing. If you have promised to do the interchange, please do it for us. Because people have lost their jobs due to the eviction. It would be a disgrace if you don't complete the project. Monsana Monya Maya. Now, yes, some more yes, who are drus and son of Sotia and Futrono and Futro and some young Monja Maya. And Sadia and a higher city and Futro say, and Mauna. I am a magazine for the pet and puntu. Yes, say, and ye, ye, nay, ye. And ye, pet is on my bear coin, am I? So, yes, and now, Kumasi, and now, we want progress, so we support this project. We have never opposed it, but we are pleading with the government to fast track its construction. And my zine for the force, or when you're quite my own, not on my animal, so empty, no money. Meanwhile, the Swami Municipal Assembly has started a public sensitization campaign on a planned road diversion ahead of the project construction takeoff. For Joe News, Nana Bwachitan Kwayatom. Back in Accra, residents of Domi Pillar 2 in the Ga East Municipality of the Greater Accra Region are concerned about what they perceive as exorbitant bills delivered to them by the ECG's electronic billing system. They are thus thus calling on the power company to address the challenges. There's more in this report by Karen Hoping. Residents of Domipila 2 in the greater Accra region are becoming increasingly alarmed by what they describe as the abnormally high electricity bills they are compelled to pay due to the implementation of electronic payment systems by the electricity company of Ghana. They have been on the ECG's electronic billing app since September 2022, but argue the app does not accurately depict their actual consumption, resulting in overbilling. It's been about 12 months since we received paper bills for postpaid meters at least because I know of other houses around here that have prepaid and they don't have this problem. So since September 2022, no paper bills here. We contacted ACG and we were told that we can just do estimates around what we've been paying in the past and then go ahead and pay until this is resolved. But we know that there have been tariff increases. So we are thinking to ourselves, what if you are underpaying? And revenue is still being collected. You are here, they come and they want to collect money. If not, they are disconnecting you. So we're concerned about the fact that probably we are underpaying or something. We just need visibility into what we actually need to pay. Just give us our bills. But it never came. The residents say they are unable to view previous usage, therefore making it impossible to budget. If you are on, on a YAM phone, on a YAM phone, this is how you go about it. If you are on, on, on Android, this is how you go about it. If you want to see your charges, maybe this kind, whatever that is happening, people have to get access to it because it's not everyone who even have a phone. So this uh, app that is coming up for the changes about electricity, they have to educate people for them to understand, to get access. So, because someone who is at the village, maybe an old woman, you paying bill, no one is around. How is she going to do that? In 2020, the electricity company of Ghana launched a mobile application designed to make the purchase of electricity credit and the payment of bills convenient for customers. Karen Obin's report, read to you. Now, the absence of a functional neonatal intensive care unit is a cause for worry to quality health care delivery in the OT region. This is according to Dr. Oseiko for the OT Regional Director for Health. As of half year 2023, the neonatal mortality rate is 3.6 of every 1,000 live births. This situation, health service providers in the region believe is high. Peter Seno has more in the following report. 
Later mortality rates also increased from 1.2% in the half year of 2022 to 3.6% during the same period 2023. It means when our children are born, within the first 28 days, they die. It used to be the fight against maternal mortality, but now it is neonatal mortality. The current neonatal mortality rate of 3.6% of every 1,000 live births is attributed to the non-availability of functional neonatal intensive care units at the various health facilities across the region. Currently, the supposed regional hospital, Rara Government Hospital, has only one functioning incubator and a baby warmer to take care of newborn babies with health complications. Dr. Ose Kufafre is the regional director for health. He has been speaking at the 2023 Half Year Performance Review meeting. One of our challenging areas, as you are mentioning, is high neonatal deaths that we have seen uh, this year which is very, very worrying, with many of the deaths occurring within the first five to seven days after the babies have been born. And our analysis have shown that uh, we don't have proper neonatal intensive care units, or what we call NICU. We don't even have incubators in the region to be able to incubate or help uh, babies who are premature uh, and they are born. He's appealing for support to remedy the situation. So we are Now, over 120 toilet facilities are expected to be handed over to public basic schools in the greater Kumasi metropolitan area for November this year. The initiative under the Sanitation and Water Project is to improve access to toilet facilities at the over 1,000 public primary schools in the region. There's more in this report. Region. Accessibility to convenient toilet facilities still remain elusive to many communities across the country, especially in schools. A 2017 report by the Ghana Education Service showed more than 7,400 public basic schools out of the over 20,000 lacked toilet facilities. Out of the number, nearly 1,500 schools in the Ashanti region are without toilet facilities. Under the Greater Kumasi Metropolitan Area Sanitation and Water Project, over 120 toilet facilities have been built for public basic schools in the metropolis awaiting commissioning in November. Engineer George Esidu is the project coordinator of GKMA Sanitation and Water Project. A number of the schools in Ghana do not have access to improved toilet facilities. And if you are to achieve SDG 6, we need to ensure that everyone living anywhere have access to improved toilet facility. In Kumasi, we are about to hand over all the 20, 129 facilities. Um, we are almost um, at the point of handing over. All of them will be finished by November 2023. And so we don't want to wait for the facilities are handed over before we begin to think of how to maintain and operate these facilities. Mr. Siedu says the new facilities have used features for the physically challenged among other consumables to support girls during menstruation well time and resources to go to the farm site to monitor the condition of the farm and to manually irrigate it may deter many from partaking in this venture Fortunately, a mechanical engineering student of the Suniani Technical University has developed a smart farming system to curtail these problems. Well, Lava FM's Kwesi Debra speaks with the developer Esther Abani for Tech Thursday. Smart Green, that's our innovative project. We have it embedded in an app. We have created an app for it. And with the app, we have the farm. And when you go to the farm like this, it tells you the temperature, the humidity, and the moisture content. But right now, I have not kept the sensor inside the soil, so it will be zero. But when I put the sensor inside the soil, it will begin to read um, the moisture content in the soil. So let's give it some time. So as I'll be talking. So it tells us the moisture content in the soil. So let's take lettuce, for instance. If we are um, planting lettuce, lettuce um, needs more water and can be watered twice a week. And then, it, you know, we know lettuce is shallow. It has shallow roots. So this is the moisture content right now. So the moisture content is 14%. The humidity is 78. And the temperature is 27.1. That's for the surrounding of this right now. And so 
there are other things that we have in the app. We have visual uh, assist, which you can click on it and then ask, oh, how do I plant lettuce? How do I plant tomatoes? It will assist you. And then we have the learning aspects of it. You can also click on it. It will tell you how to plant some things and then what are the things you can do with it. We have the visual farm and then we have the plant diagnose. With the plant diagnose, you just take a picture of the plant and then you upload it on Google. And it will tell you the disease that the plant is having right now. And then with the pump right now, we have it. And then if, let me say, the moisture content is not up to what the plant needs. All you need to do is just click on the pump and then the water will begin to come. So, um, this is it. We have the pump on and then we have the other thing. So when we click here, click on the pump on, it will begin to um, sprinkle the water for you if you are using sprinklers. But if you are using a tube like this, it will, you can lay it somewhere that it will spread the water throughout the place. And then when it's enough for what you need, all you need to do is to long press on the pump and then it will do pump off and then it will go off. Well, we're taking a break for business. You're still watching Journeys today. Do stay with us. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Axis Bank Ghana and Deloitte Ghana have begun the SME Business Interaction Series. The project, which is aimed at helping small businesses with funding, will provide money to expand the operations of 10,000 SMEs. Here's more in this report. Businesses in Ghana continue to face funding challenges due to the difficult economic conditions faced by the country. To help solve the challenge, Access Bank Ghana and Deloitte Ghana have collaborated to help small businesses access cheap funding. Group Head of Business Banking at Access Bank Ghana, Kafui Bimpe, speaking to Joy Business, said the project is designed to train SME on bookkeeping, taxation and governance. What you see here today is just a continuation of what we have been doing at another level. Um, we are so committed to the development of SMEs, we want to bring them to the level that we see globally, uh, growing them to become multi major multinationals. So over the years we have provided a number of uh, imperatives for them, including migrating them to digital space, including giving them um, market access to market, provided finance to them. Today we is a first of its kind. We started our business interaction series, and we are brought on board Deloitte Ghana. Everybody knows Deloitte, the wealth of knowledge they have, the experience, the exposure they have. So we are bringing that to the SMEs to just help them build capacity to be able to develop further. He advised SMEs to develop skills acquired from the workshop to expand their businesses. They should expect significant growth in their business through the superior knowledge that will be shared, through the tools that will be given them by Deloitte and Tools, and the fact that we will also be able to continue to support them in terms of giving them finance. It is not worth giving them money when they don't have capacity to scale up their business or when they cannot derive them. Now, the third clinic of the Ecobank Journeys Habitat Fair is expected to offer products at prices significantly below the market rate. That is assurance from General Manager for Sales and Customer Service at the Multimedia Group, uh, David Max Fuga. According to him, the decision to host this third mini clinic in Tema is due to the increasing number of housing projects in the Tema metropolis. Max Fuga also mentioned that regulators will be present to educate and inform patrons about the process of acquiring a house. All we seek to do with the Habitat Fair is to create a platform for all those who are within the housing value chain to showcase their products and services to property seekers and to anybody else who is interested in everything housing. Um, this year, we decided to expand beyond uh, the traditional areas. We've always been at uh, Achimota Mall. We've always been at West Hills Mall. We've always been at the Janshi Mall, Teshinungwa. But this year, we realized that there's a lot of development taking place in and around Tema. And so we decided to move to Tema to give opportunity to property developers, to property seekers, to those who want to are interested in the, the auxiliary services, 
roofing sheds, uh, furniture, everybody. People who are within that catchment area to have the opportunity to shop for their needs at one place. So we are looking at the Tema Township itself. We are looking at uh, Boom, Pram Pram, Dawenya, all the way to Chopoli. And then the Fienya side, the Michel Kam side, um, part of uh, Nungwa, part of Teshi, part of Spinters Road. There's a lot of development taking place there. And we believe that those people need to be catered for. You don't need to drive all the way to Accra. You don't need to spend precious time searching for the things they want. So we are bringing Habitat Fair to their doorstep. So you just have to walk in to the Tema Municipal Assembly and then shop for everything that they want for their housing projects. If you walk into the Habitat Fair at the Tema Municipal uh, Assembly from 15th to 17th, you can be sure that whatever you're going to purchase there will be far less than the market price. One other thing is that we are ensuring the variety. And so you are not only going to see the real estate developers, you're going to see everybody in that value chain there. And so that's another plus for the Tema Fair. That, is, that did not happen at the two other fairs that, or mini fairs that we've organized so far. Some, this time we are bringing some regulators. Okay, fortunately we are doing it within the, the assembly, uh, assembly premises. We are bringing the regulators who will also be there to guide people in acquiring properties. For us, it is very important. You, yes, you want to acquire a property, but you need to be guided. And so we are providing, we are making sure that there for people who will need guidance in property. All right, and that's it for this segment. Do stay tuned. There's more coming up after this break. As we sports now, on joining us today with me, Muftao Nabila, Abla Black Stars head coach Chris Hilton says he and his boys are committed to protecting the record of the Syrian national team not losing at Ababayala Sports Stadium. Ghana is coming up against Central Africa Republic in the last round of the AFCON qualifiers for 2023. And he says it is important they pick up a point to be able to secure qualification to the tournament next year. Very, very conscious of what uh, this game means. Um, not only the, the nation, but of course the, myself, and the players and everybody involved, we know what this game means. So our preparation um, has been for the last two days. You know, I've often spoke about the difficulty of, of preparation at international level, but it's the same. It's the same for the Central African Republic team training today and playing tomorrow and it's the same for us and we will do everything that we can to get uh, the result that we want to get. Um, so our preparation has been good uh, as with all international camps sometimes you miss players through injuries and of course we are missing some uh, through injuries but it's always an opportunity for others. We are playing at home, we have a good record here and it's a record that uh, we want to continue. There's nobody that has the right to be in any squad. They have to earn that right. And that can come in different ways. That can come with somebody like Andre, who's our captain, who's uh, a big influence and, and respectful player, respectful player around the squad. So for what he can add to the squad. Um, and Ed Manadu, you know, for the games that he's played and also for the options that we have in central midfield and um, you might think different but we um, certainly as from offensive offensive midfield you know we don't have as many options as what we have in other positions you know particularly players that have played uh, and been in previous squads so for, for every player that's in there there's a thought process that goes on you know nobody Meanwhile, a Central African Republic head coach, Raul Savoy, he says that his team is here to upset the Black Stars and secure the ticket 
to the African Cup of Nations that will be staged in uh, Cote d'Ivoire. He says that there are three countries that still stand a chance of qualifying, and Central African Republic will give their best when it comes to this game. We are three teams still in the race. Uh, for us, we missed the qualification last game against Angola in Douala. So now we know exactly what we have to do tomorrow. So now for tomorrow, now we know that we need a result, clearly. So that I, I, I don't want to say that it, be, it will be first uh, easy, but we are, we are going to fight. And see, you know, every game has a story, and we'll see tomorrow at the end of the game exactly we will be happy and uh, of course not. But for us, we are humble. We know that we are going to fight, and uh, let's see tomorrow uh, the story as it is end. He says, let's wait and see what happens later today. The game will be happening at Bawaii Sports Center at 4 p.m. And we're bringing you a commentary on Joy 99.7 FM. My colleague, Fen Chiwetai, who will be joined by Gal Alsmith, Daniel Cranthin, and Razak Musbao. To some politics, Governor Fair, um, Georgia Freer, eh, who was vying to become the president of the Ghana Football Association, has been disqualified from the race by the Elections Committee of the Ghana Football Association. According to the football governed by the Elections Committee, Georgia Freer eh, um, was endorsed by some members who either did not sign the document or um, they, he secured uh, the signatures of uh, one of the members fraudulently. They described it as falsehood being peddled by one of the members who signed it, specifically Jeffrey Asari, who claimed to be a director of Victory Football Club and signed and endorsed the form of Georgia Freer is not the authorized signatory per the status of the Ghana Football Association. Hence, the GFA have decided to disqualify Georgia Freer from contesting in the elections, which scheduled for later this month. The elections currently is on hold because of King Faisal's decision to injunct the process at the Accra High Court. The case will be heard on September 19. That's your sports for now. We do have more sports stories on myjoyonline.com. Up next. It's time for showbiz now and Ghanaian actress and model Nikki Simono says that the Ghanaian movie industry has seen significant improvement in recent years. She explained that the industry did take a hit during and after the COVID period since it's been difficult for them to shoot. But now things are looking better. She spoke to Joe News. Every single time music is in the news but we don't see movies in the news every time. Why is that? Because it's simple. Uh, music is noisy. Music is everywhere. Music is not, uh, uh, sorry, movies is not as loud as music. And so, no, uh, music flows. Music is water. Uh, movie is fire. Movie is earth. That's how I see it. And so, no, obviously, music is going to be making a lot of noise or a lot of uh, uh, people are going to know about it more than movies. Every now and then, movie be they cry, but music is constant and it's wavy, you know. I think that's why, that's why it's like that. Would you agree with uh, people or the West on the streets that uh, the, the, the movie industry has slowed down a bit? Huh? How? No. Since when? No, no, no. Right now, right now the movie is, 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 is up. I mean, it dipped really hard. Uh, after COVID, and or yeah, in fact, after COVID, it went really yes because it was difficult for us to come back up. But now, with a lot of uh, corporate investments and investors, especially like Papa Magic and Daddy, and a lot of uh, like I said, corporate investors coming in and coming on board because now we are used to the digitization. Now, despite the recent trend in Afrobeat music, dancehall artist episode says high life is the future. Let's listen to him explain why. Um, that is where the world has got into. They've grabbed onto Afrobeat. But I want to say that High Life is the sound of the future. Because what I say is, there's a whole like five decades of a catalog, a Ghanaian catalog before Afrobeat, which we've not touched yet. If Ghana has close to 600 rhythms, we've not scratched the surface yet. So I believe that High Life is the sound of the future.
and some of us are, are proud. I'm not saying that last year to this year, I'm the only person to do it. <laughs> world best. Everything is saying is the truth. <laughs> we come, we'll come to world best really shortly. Episode one of the finest, and listen, I'm saying it's one of the best dancer right. artists in the world. Hear that? What best? All right. <laughs> I think we'll just end on that, you know, endorsement to know. Big up. You don't know, man. Fully endorsed. Um, that is where the world has got into. Indeed, that's where the world has gotten to. And that's how we wrap up, Jen. Today, for more news, please log on to myjoyonline.com. My name is Faustina Safo. It's been a pleasure doing this 60 Minutes with you.